Hey everyone. So um, I'm very, very excited about today's conversation with the critics. Um, it is right on the hour. So I'll just uh, briefly introduce myself. My name is Dexter Wimberly. I'm a senior critic at New York Academy of Art. Um, I'm also an independent curator. And um, I guess through the course of today's conversation, we might talk about some of the other things that I'm involved with. But this is not about me. This is about our wonderful panelists today. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Krista Clark. Uh, Krista is an independent curator and senior advisor at the Center for Curatorial Leadership. Previously, she was curator of the Arts of Global Africa at the Museum, of, pardon me, at the Newark Museum of Art, where her work was supported with major grants from the Mellon Foundation and the National Endowment of Humanities. During her 16-year tenure at Newark, she organized exhibitions on topics ranging from men's fashion to Nigerian modernism and established Newark's significant collection of modern and contemporary African art. Since 2018, Krista has served as consulting curator to various institutions, including Smith College Museum of Art, the Peggy Guggenheim Collection, Williams College Museum of Art, and the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. In addition to her curatorial work, Krista has been a research fellow at Harvard University, the Clark Art Institute, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Smithsonian, and held teaching appointments at NYU, Abu Dhabi, um, University of Pennsylvania and Boston University. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Krista. Thanks for having me. Um, I'd also like to introduce Julia Halpern. <clears throat> She's executive editor of Art News, where she oversees editorial operations for the world's most widely read news site and manages a staff of editors and writers in London, Berlin, and New York. She is also the co-founder of the Burns Halpern Report, a data-driven report on equity in museums and the art market. Previously, she served as museum's editor for the art newspaper, where she oversaw international coverage of museums and other major art institutions, um, and as news editor of Art and Auction magazine. Her writing has appeared in Wired, The New York Observer, and New York Magazine. Thank you for joining us today, Julia. Thanks for having me. I'm also happy to introduce Arthur Lewis. He's a partner and creative director of Fine Arts and UTA Artist Space at leading global talent, entertainment, and sports company. Um, he's a patron of the arts and a significant collector of both emerging art and contemporary African-American art. He is a member of the Board of Governors for Otis College of Art and Design and on the boards of AMFAR, Prospect New Orleans, and USC Roski School of Art and Design. Additionally, he is a member of the National Advisory Committee for the New Orleans African-American Museum and a global council member for the Studio Museum in Harlem. He's a well-known and distinguished figure in the art world. He joined UTA in 2019 to oversee the Fine Arts Division and Exhibition Space. Thank you for joining us today, Arthur. Thrilled to be here. So this is an unusual opportunity for three people who don't know each other um, to get together and uh, not only meet one another, but to talk about the work that they're doing and also some of the interesting things that are happening in the art world these days. I'm certain that everyone who's joining us today is coming with some curiosity about each of you, the organizations you're connected with, the projects you've worked on, things you're looking forward to in the future, and your opinions on some of the craziest things that are happening in the world today, both inside and outside of the art world, I'm sure. Um, so I'd like to begin, um, I'll go in reverse here. So I'll start with Arthur to talk a little bit about the work that you do at UTA and why are you so passionate about the art world? Oh boy, um, I, you know, I thought I was going to be in permanent retirement for quite some time and met the founder of UTA and talked about, you know, this art space thing that they created and would I ever be interested in joining and exploring this opportunity a little bit further. And now almost three and a half years later, I can say for sure, this is my absolute favorite job. So I get to do my hobby like every single day at work. I get to work with amazing young artists, well-established artists, um, entertainment figures, sports figures, and introduce them to the art world. It, it's kind of the coolest job uh, in the entire world. So there's nothing better than having a conversation with Titus Kafar in the AM and finishing with LeBron James talking about a painting in the PM. It's, it's kind of baller on a whole other level. So, so far for me, it's been amazing, man. That's great. That's great. That's very exciting. I've been to UTA um, a couple of times um, when I, visiting LA, and uh, I really admire the program there. And I'm sure that for folks who either have or haven't visited, they're kind of curious to know 
How does UTA go about identifying emerging artists to show in the space? Well, I think, you know, as a collector, it was a really easy decision to make to find artists who were in um, the arts community that really hadn't been shown. That's what talent agencies do. So we just applied that model to the art world to just be out there in the world, find people we thought told great stories who were either underrepresented in the art world or just simply hadn't been given an opportunity. I think what makes it a lot fun for me, a lot more fun for me is that I'm an, obviously I'm an art collector. So it's hard not to shop during some of this, which just is like conflict of interest, like nothing you've ever seen before in your life. But I want these artists to see the world. I want people to get to know who they are and discover them. And it's been honestly just three years of introducing the world to just great young talent um, and allowing whatever that story is to happen and then move into the rest of the art world, go to great galleries, go to great museum shows, and just be a nice touch point for them in the beginning of their careers. Well, it sounds like you're having a great time in the art world, Arthur. <laughs> I am, I really am, I really, really am. <laughs> um, and so uh, one of the things we all chatted about before we got started today is that we're all in different cities. Uh, so Arthur is traveling right now, he's in New Orleans, Krista's in Boston, Julia is in New York. So Julia, let's move over to you, being in New York City, which, you know, I'm a New York, I'm a native New Yorker, though I live in Japan now, um, but you know, the argument could be made that New York is still the, the epicenter of the, the art world, you know, the capital A art world. I'm sure some would take me to task on that, but let's just say for the sake of today's conversation, that's sort of true. Um, what's, uh, you know, what's on your plate these days at Artnet? I'm sure that's a loaded question because there's a lot on your plate. There's a lot to talk about in the art world. Uh, what stories as of late have gotten you excited and talk a little bit about the work you do at Artnet. Uh, I definitely think New York, New York art people are the first to say New York is the center of the art world. It's very parochial that way. Um, I, I part of what I like doing here at Arnett is working with writers in other cities too to to really get a glimpse at what's going on elsewhere. Um, but yes, yeah, so at Arnett, I've been there. I've been here for about five and a half years, and I. Um, manage the the team that runs our news operation so we are the largest i think it, both in terms of people and in terms of page views um art news publication in the world we get well over 100 million page views a year um and so it's been a process of trying to figure out how do we kind of create content that is really nourishing and meaningful to people who are professionally in the art world but also kind of grow the audience and bring people who might like come for an archaeology discovery or a Banksy and like stay for a discussion of politics and museums. <laughs> um, that's kind of how we we think about it is is um, in this sort of fried egg model where the egg white is the much larger um, audience that that is sort of drops in and drops out and they would come to us not through our newsletters, but through, you know, social media or a link here or there. And then there's like the yoke, which is our, you know, really nutrient rich, dedicated audience. Um, and they want something different from us. They want, you know, really incisive reporting. They are experts themselves. Um, and so it's about sort of creating an ecosystem of content with the amazing journalists we have, um, where anybody reading either, you know, if there's a primary audience for one article, we want the secondary audience to still you know, get it and enjoy it. Um, and so that that's sort of the way that we think of of building an editorial kind of ecosystem um, is is serving that egg and also kind of serving a balanced meal to people of of protein, but also some some snacks in there too. And <laughs> thank you for sharing that, Julie. And and obviously, you know, I think that a lot of the artists and or gallerists and or um, you know, people who are sort of active in the art world are curious as to like, how do they go about getting covered in such a publication? Is it just a matter of sending in a press release? Do they need to email an editor directly? It, you know, obviously it's probably case by case, but I'd love to just hear a little bit about your thoughts on that. And I'm sure you get that question all the time. Yeah, email is tough. I'm gonna look right now. Okay, so I have 107,000 uh, 850 on red emails. <laughs> um, so and a lot of journalists get a lot of emails. I may, I may, I may be one of those emails. You might be. I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think we, I think there are sort of, this is, this is somewhat of a technical answer, but I think that there are two 
but it's a way that I think most people who aren't in media don't necessarily think. Publications, we're looking for things that speak to larger trends, larger issues, larger moments in the world, because, you know, we're, we want to be engaged with what's going on. Um, and so, for example, today we're looking at, uh, I had a writer looking into the relationship between Latoya Ruby Frazier, who's from Braddock, Pennsylvania, and has made a lot of work about that, and John Fetterman, who just won um, a congressional race, and she's made some work kind of in response to him. And so that's that's a kind of story where we want to see what art can, can art give us any more insight into bigger things that are happening in the world. So if you are working on a project that speaks to a bigger thing happening in the world, I think that's a, a really opportune moment to reach out to press and to reach out to Artnet. Um, the other way is to really get to know a publication that you're interested in and see what sort of stuff they do regularly. You know, we have columns that we run each week, like studio visit with an artist or a questionnaire with an art collector. Um, and so, you know, we need to fill those. Um, and if you have something that might work, um, we would love to hear it. So it's about, I think, being aware of what, of how what you're doing might connect with a broader, you know, event or moment in the world and also really getting familiar with the publication that you're looking at. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. So Krista, you're, you're, you're coming to us from Boston today. And as I mentioned, you know, I, I have so many intersections with your career over the course of my career. Um, some of them have been professionals, others have just been me as a fan of the work that you do. Um, as I mentioned, I have some of your books on the shelf behind me and I do actually read them. Um, <laughs> and I've, and I've referred to them as resources for projects that I either have worked on or would like to work on. Um, and so I'm a big, big admirer of yours. Can you talk a little bit about the, the work that you're doing now and, and how that um, intersects with the art world? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Dexter, for reading my books. Um, and Julia, I just want to say I love your fried egg analogy. I'm going to have to think about this, use that in f the future. Um, I feel like I've I've kind of emerged from a period of doing deep, deep research. Um, I just finished a book this uh, the end of last year that's coming out next year um, called The Activist Collector. And um, so I feel for the for much of the past last year, I was kind of I was in this office where I am now. I didn't see people. I was, you know, writing every day. Um, but I'm really excited to have this book launch into the world because it tells a really unusual story um, of a collection formed by an African-American woman from Newark, New Jersey, who kind of saved her money as a hairstylist and a housekeeper and became a grassroots activist and went to South Africa in 1938, which is kind of extraordinary because it's, you know, right when South Africa had instituted a series of laws that became apartheid. And she formed this collection, mostly given to her by women who were forming organizations that weren't seen as political, but were actually deeply political. Um, and she came to kind of value the role of culture. So she was collecting beadwork, very modest pieces of um, art given to her as gifts. And she brought it back and had these activist exhibitions in Newark and New York and elsewhere. Um, so I basically used this collection, which was at the Newark Museum. Um, her grandsons out of the blue came and gave her archive uh, about eight years ago. And so I dug through this archive. I read her diary. I looked at her photo albums and I kind of unpacked the story of these people um, on either side of the Atlantic who kind of shared this vision of black liberation in the interwar period and used art and material culture as a way to kind of um, activate people, mobilize people um, in South Africa and in, in the US. So I've kind of come out of that period and now I'm working for the Center for Curatorial Leadership among other things, consulting for museums. And so I haven't, done uh, a deep dive. I've done some writing as well. I've worked on um, Sanford Biggers Chimera series for an upcoming exhibition in England. 
Um, so I kind of have been all over the map, but I'm very much focused this coming year on working to support curators through the Center for Curatorial Leadership. And can you talk a little bit more about the Center for Curatorial Leadership for those who don't know um, much about it? What is the gen generally like what is the function of the organization? So the organization was formed uh, 16 years ago, actually, um, to at a time when museum directors were coming not from curatorial ranks, but um, from the business world and other places. And it was formed to give curators the skills, leadership skills to, to basically enter positions as museum directors or more broadly leadership positions as chief curators. Um, I went through the program myself 10 years ago and um, it's just an amazing program that, that has supports curators and gives them a way to lead in a kind of equitable and empathetic way to, to lead today's organizations. Um, it also has a program that introduces curatorial skills to graduate students as well. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, I've come on board as it's entered its 15th year to kind of um, help evolve the program to kind of make sure that we are reaching a wide possible network and applicants um, to make sure that we remain relevant. Uh, to make sure that uh, equity is at, at the center of what we we teach and what we um, kind of the values of our program. So it's really exciting to me. Thank you for sharing that. And I want to talk a little bit more about um, this term that has come up a few times um, already today. And that, that, that term is, is equity. Um, and I know that it means different things to different people, um, whether it's based on ethnicity or gender or age or geography, but I'd love for each of you to kind of give me your thoughts around this idea as it relates to equity in the art world, whether it's from a perspective of museums or the work that you do. Uh, and I'll, I'll come to you, author, because I know this is something you probably spend an awful lot of time thinking about as well. I mean, your role um, has been very influential in terms of, as you mentioned, giving some artists their first opportunity to have a major show, but you also collect, and a lot of that is private, right? People don't know, your, your, your private ins and outs, but talk a little bit about equity and what it means to you and why it's important. I think, I think one of the most amazing things about what's happening in the world is that uh, there's just more opportunity for people to be seen. And whether it is through their choice of using Instagram or you know TikTok or other means of communicating with the world, we see more of each other. And I think as a collector, when you're doing that, it is a very private experience and they're not many people who get to see the stories that you're pulling together. Um, in your own special way. Uh, part of inviting people into your home, like the Center for Curatorial Excellence, like people get to see another chapter of someone's story. So what I've tried to do is bring a little bit of that to UTA. So there is a lot of introduction. There is a lot of storytelling. Um, there's a lot of intros that we make to others in the art world who may not have known someone has been working at their particular practice for quite some time. So for me, I look at equity as a place of just evening out the playing field a little bit and just making sure that everyone gets an opportunity to shine, whether that be in our space or another space where they launch and go to a, a really big gallery. I, I love that there's a young artist, Ferrari Shepherd, um, that you know my partner Howe and I uh, discovered in a coffee shop in the Merck Park in Los Angeles and uh, purchased two paintings, hung them on the wall, Collectors go nuts when other collectors have things people don't want. It's a whole thing. Um, I told him to buckle up. Lo and behold, he's now on Beyonce's wall. I mean, it's it's insane. And now he's with the Massimo Di Carlo Gallery in Italy. I couldn't be happier. So just watching that journey and that experience is a lot of what happens in the world of talent. And I didn't really see how closely related those worlds are. But my job is not different than that of another agent in the agency. It's sort of nurturing the talent, getting them ready for the next thing. And because we are not a traditional art space, we really do get to send artists out into the world and, and watch them flourish and just stay part of their journey. Thank you for sharing that. And I wanna remind anyone that is joining us today that if you do have questions, you can raise your hand or, or put them in the chat. We can uh, make that happen. Don't wait to the very end if you do. Julia, so you're the co-founder of the Burns Halperin Report. Um, and this is a data-driven report on equity in museums and the art market. Can you talk a little bit about why that exists, uh, the report? What was the motivation, impetus behind it? And talk a little bit about the work you do with it. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I um, started working on this and at the time we just thought it was going to be an article. Um, and then five years later, it's a whole thing um, with a former colleague, Charlotte Burns. Um, and we were just at, it, we were at a bar one night and we were talking about stuff we'd read. And at the time, it was 2018. And um, there was an, an article, I think in Bloomberg that was talking that where the headline was like, it's a great time to be an African-American artist. Um, and we were like, hmm. like it was the middle of the Trump presidency, like seemed like <laughs> If it were, if that were the case, then the art world would be totally out of step probably with the rest of the world. And so that would be an interesting thing to look into. And if it weren't true, then we should stop saying it. Um, and so we decided that one way to do this, which hadn't, you know, we'd told the kind of lazy version of that story before ourselves a number of times, right? You just like interview a couple of people and you find three things and that's trend and whatever. Um, and so we decided to take a bit of a different tack and, um, and assembled a data set of 30 institutions across the US um, and the acquisitions that they had made of work by Black American artists from 2008 to 2018. Um, and found that, in fact, the, our kind of perception of progress had been wildly out of step with reality. Um, and, and so continued to do that. We did that the following year for female identifying artists um, and found the same thing. Uh, in both cases, the kind of the level of of acquisitions were about a fifth of what it should be if, you know, if you believe, as I do, that museums should rep, could reflect the, the country and the, the regions that they're in. Um, and so this time around, we've sort of, we've formalized it, we've made a, a sort of more robust data set looking at, it's 31 institutions now, and it's a different group that I think is more representative of the country. Um, it's you know, before our samples were kind of clustered on the coasts. Um, and so we have created a kind of now baseline data set that we can work from that is from 2008 to 2020 um, and looks at acquisitions of uh, female identifying artists, Black American artists, and then Black female American artists, um, and sort of starting to build a data set that can both talk to talk to itself and talk to other people who are collecting different kinds of data. Um, and it's just been a process of, of challenging our own perception of what's happening um, and realizing that the, these kind of totemic events can skew our sense, some people's sense, I should say. Some people are very aware already of the state of things. Um, but, but giving us a kind of common baseline to work from uh, so that we're all sort of operating on the same, in the same reality of what's actually going on. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing. I often think that, you know, the art world, and that is a broad term that we use so, so readily, that is a great generalization when, when I say the art world, like, what am I talking about? But I think the art world definitely has an idealized vision of itself, or that is not necessarily the reality of, of itself. Um, and and when I think about that statement, I'm, I'm drawn to think about these, these latest events with climate activists, um, for lack of a better word, vandalizing important artworks to get their point across. Um, comedians have had a field day on this. Um, I don't need to try to tell anybody else's jokes. <laughs> There's plenty of them out there. Um, I have my own opinions about it. And, and today's conversation isn't about my opinions about it, but I'm, I'm curious to know why do you think these activists are choosing important paintings when one could argue that the world generally, generally doesn't know an awful lot about art? Like it seems like an interesting target for to get this point across um, to a broader audience when the average person couldn't really name 10 important paintings, quote unquote important paintings. Um, why do you think they're targeting important artworks? Your opinion doesn't have to be reflective of the institution or organization you're involved with, but why do you think that is? Anybody? Nobody wants to touch that? <laughs> not really, but like, I, I'm not really, I mean, honestly, like, I'm not sure what uh, these objects represent to these different people. So I'm not really sure. Yeah. And it's so interesting because um, you know, as we're planning shows and uh, Freeze is coming up in LA and uh, I'm really excited. We're going to do this amazing Ernie Barnes show and Ernie's markets now 
uh, of spectacular fashion. And one of the lenders of the show said, okay, great. So are you going to put everything behind like glass so that no one destroys a painting? And in my head, I'm like, who's going to destroy an Ernie Barnes painting? But I don't know that. So it, it sort of forced another conversation. So I, I'm very curious to hear more. And I, it, it forced me to actually like dive into finding out what's actually going on and with some of the reason behind some of these things, because these are, in this particular situation, historical objects that do have special meaning for some people in our community. And to your point, Dexter, I'm not sure what, you know, that destruction actually does or symbolize. So I feel like I have a lot more educating of myself to understand it a little better. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think I do as well, um, you know, because it's easy to have knee jerk reactions to these kinds of occurrences, you know, oh, it's silly or oh, it's stupid. It's fun. I, I, tr I try to unpack it, try to empathize, put myself in the different people's shoes, think it through. But one thing it does, one thing that does concern me, and, and one could argue, obviously, climate change is a much bigger issue than concerns about, you know, quote unquote art. Um, I think that's not really debatable. But what does concern me is that and, and, and my, my wife and I, we've talked about this. There was an incident, had nothing to do with art. There were a group of people who were pouring milk out in um, supermarkets in the UK, I believe it was. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's the same people who work there, who labor there, that have to clean this up, that have to be inconvenienced, that have to like, you know, it, it, it doesn't take into account the, the, um, the uh, collateral um, reverberation of that that kind of damage and so to your collectors concerns about loaning work to the show so what happens when collectors no longer want to let, let work out of their house so, you know and, and for, for for good reason right <laughs> it's sort of like yeah you can get insurance on it but insurance doesn't replace the work right it's just it's money in exchange for damage but it doesn't really replace irreplaceable work so it could have a negative effect on a lot of things that people don't take into consideration but again um this is not a conversation about climate change. I just wanted to get a little bit of an opinion on some of these strange, let's call them strange things that are happening. Krista, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I mean, I don't really have anything much to add to what's been said. I think it's bizarre, but I also think it's part of a long historical trajectory of the defacement of art. I mean, I cannot think of the painting off the top of my head, but there's a famous incident at the National Gallery in London with the suffragette who kind of slashed the painting. Um, Julia, you might remember that. I, uh, so I think it's part of this, you know, longer trajectory where art, you know, for all that it symbolizes, um, you know, it's it kind of symbolizes this kind of, you know, humanity. Um, it gets a lot of attention, you know. So I just think it's it it's it's been a target for a hundred years in various incidents. Yeah, yeah, that that's that sounds right to me. And Julia, how about you? What, I'm, I'm sure there's been obviously you guys have covered it. There's been conversations internally. I mean, what what's your take on some of this? I feel like I have to be the like defacer advocate here <laughs> in a way. Okay. I mean, I don't. I don't, I'm not fully on their side, but I do feel important to, that it's important to fact check that there actually has been little to no damage done to the artworks. Um, they're all done to um, either on glass or um, like on pedestals or there, there has been damage to frames, um, but to the artworks themselves, there has not, I don't believe, at least our reporting has shown any kind of damage that required extensive conservation. Um, I feel, I feel my, obviously there is in, an instinct, it's so outlandish that you kind of, there's so many jokes you can make as you said, but I also have this compassion that these are young people who feel so desperate that they have, that their future and their potential children's futures are in danger, that they are, they have to try to I don't think it's rational. It's it's about trying to get attention from something that society holds dear or that they believe is a kind of ten, as Chris has said, like like jostle our common humanity. I don't think it's effective. You know, I think that people who it's gonna it's preaching to the choir and and it doesn't have actually real kind of concrete asks behind it. Um, so I think the most it could do is just kind of like everyone's aware that the climate is not it's not going great. Um, but I think 
I do, in a way, it, I don't know, I find it also speaks to the power of art that they feel that this is a way that they can have their message heard around the world. Um, and so even though I don't think it's a good idea or that it's going to work, I do feel like it's not unconnected from the reason why we all do what we do. Mm -hmm. I think that's very fair. Um, and I, and I, and as I mentioned about trying to have empathy and find a, find a way to kind of see this from different perspectives, that's something that, you know, I, I often um, try to do as well, but, you know, um, that subject's a bit of a downer. So let's, let's go a little bit upbeat from here. Um, <laughs> so um, all of you are, are busy people working on a variety of different projects. Could each of you tell me about something that you're looking forward to um, that is either on your plate or on the horizon that you're really excited about that's in development? And so far as you're able to talk about it, we'll start with, uh, with you, Arthur. Um, Titus Kafar, uh, who is an extraordinary artist, um, is someone that we represent in the fine art space. So uh, he has a gallery, it's Gagosian, but what we actually do is we help artists maneuver through Hollywood. Um, he is working on a motion picture based on a set of his paintings, which I won't, I can't say that part, but um, it is, it is maybe the most magical thing I've ever seen happen. Um, just because I've been such a big fan of his and a collector for so long and to see the story behind this historic body of work he created get turned into a motion picture so he can share his art with the world is priceless. Like we're, we're taking pictures for everything. I have no social media whatsoever, but like we're taking pictures and videos of every conversation because we know we're documenting something really special. So coming to a theater near you in the not too distant future will be a film by director Titus Kafar. How about that's, that? That's very, very cool. Very cool. And how about you, Krista? I know you're always working on something. <laughs> I guess the project I'm thinking about right now is um, an upcoming exhibition I'm doing for the Newberger Museum of Art in SUNY Purchase. Um, and it's focusing on works by uh, the artist Ramwald Hazume, who's based mm -hmm. in Benin. Uh, it was my last pre-pandemic trip was to his studio and it's uh he's really well known for his gas can um, masks and installations but this we're showing a body of work that has really received very little attention and it's very personal there are these large-scale canvases that are related to his study of ifa divination um and they're very abstract um kind of beautiful earth toned canvases with glyphs and symbols that relate to a very deep dive he's done as an artist since the 1990s into Aoife divination. Um, so I'm excited because he's been willing to kind of share stories about the emergence of this series and share the series as a whole um, with an audience in the US for the first time. Um, so I'm excited about showing a different side of his work than the masks that are, I think, in a way, very easily consumable for Western audiences. Um, so that's what I'm excited great. about. That's great. And Julia, for you, is it more of like, uh, you know, what you're working on for tomorrow as opposed to- <laughs> We work on many timelines. There's tomorrow. I will be editing our report on the Allen collection sale later tonight. Um, but I think the two things I would say, one is the Burns Halpern Report, the next edition is coming out the week of December 5th, and then what we've done things a little bit differently this time, and are, are, we're going to be presenting the data findings, and then we're inviting a whole host of different writers and experts and people from the museum world and the market world to kind of bring their expertise to the data and, and respond to it. So those will be published on our net throughout the month of December. Um, and then another project is the next edition of our innovators list. Um, Arthur knows this because he was on it last time. Uh, and it looks at, it's my, what I like to call our attempt to make a list that doesn't suck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. It is, it's quite an honor. <laughs> it's really high praise because it's really hard. Um, but it's it's our attempt to sort of highlight people who are are really doing innovative things in the art world and specifically kind of in the art business world, um, and and it's 
assembled really carefully and thoughtfully by talking to lots of different people and getting their recommendations so that we're really looking beyond our own kind of networks. Um, and so that will be out in late November. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. So we're down to the final 20 minutes. So we're gonna take a 90 degree turn here. Um, so as you know, this entire conversation was you know, prompted by New York Academy of Art. I'm a senior critic at New York Academy of Art. It is a school and there are students there that are learning not only how to paint and how to sculpt and how to draw, but they're also curious about their career as artists. Like what's waiting for them on the other side? <laughs> they think they know, but let's talk a little bit about like the, 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 the act of being an artist and interacting with curators and interacting with collectors and interacting with journalists. So we have, I mean, you all have multiple hats, but for the sake of this little exercise here, we have a journalist, we have a curator, we have a collector. So this is a rare opportunity for a young artist to, to, to ask questions and to think about some of these things. So I'm gonna be the proxy for the young artist because I haven't had the questions come in, but I know what the questions are. Okay, so number one, if you're, if you're just getting started, what's the best way to go about inviting people to your studio? Some of these might be very elementary questions, but these are the questions people have and maybe they're afraid to ask. So I'm gonna ask for them. So you're a new artist on the scene. You don't know a lot of people. You want to you want to get studio visits going. What's the what's the best way you can approach a collector about visiting your studio? What kind of what kind of language should you use? What should you say? I'll I'll say this to you, author, because I know you get invited all the time. Oh boy, why did I know you were going to start with me? Um, <laughs> I think I think part of it is approaching someone with the same care and practice that you make the work. So. You know, a great, like, here's who I am. This is what I do. This is why I'm interested in the art world. And this is why I think it'd be great for us to spend some time together. And I'd love your opinion on what I'm doing. And look, there are times where something amazing comes from that. And there are times when you can just be a great sounding board. And I think both are okay. So uh, being someone who does get a lot of invites to come to the studio, there are lots of times where I leave, you know, and it's like, it's great. But the question turns into, so like, what's gonna happen next? Well, that's a really big question. And some of that is the journey that you're on and who you can be connected with. And, and it means sometimes that it's gonna take longer than you'd like it to take. Or it right. may mean that I buy out your entire studio. Like it, it could be all of those things. So I think just being open to possibilities with people and not having some fixed expectation that um, person X came to my studio and, and that's it. So one of the things I have to be careful about, and we can all laugh because it just happened to me last week. I visited an artist's studio. I completely fell in love. I text my other half. I'm like, this is really amazing. We should invest in this artist and buy some work. And I get home. It's like six hours later. And four collectors from New York City called me and have pictures of what I actually bought from the studio and how could they get work. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so like, it's kind of the joy of the art world. And I was sort of like excited for this artist and also was like, really? But, you know, I, I just think it's open to whatever the world brings you and you've got to be really patient. Um, art is, this is a very subjective thing. So I may, something may not appeal to me, but it may be someone else's the best thing they've ever seen in their life. And I think you've got to be open to hearing feedback and criticism um, and encouragement that may not be in the form of what you're necessarily looking for. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. And Krista, um, my question for you is a little bit different. Um, so I've seen a trend where more and more um, museums are giving very young artists exhibitions. Um, and this isn't something that was happening in the same way, say 20 years ago, 30 years ago, for sure. Um, you know, and I can I can sort of like weigh the pros and cons of this, but it also sends a message to young artists that they should expect that. I, it, se it seems to me like I, a lot of young artists, 23 year olds are thinking, okay, museum solo within the next two years, which sort of seems a little bit off kilter to me. Um, again, I'm not trying to throw anyone under the bus here, but what are you, what are your thoughts about this and this sort of what Arthur mentioned patience? It seems like patience has just been zapped out of it, like out of the game. There's like no patience. No one's patient anymore about anything. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I come at this in a slightly different way than Arthur and Julia, I think, and yourself, because I, I mean, I'm a specialist in the arts of global Africa from historic to contemporary. So right. I feel like I'm a I have a little bit of imposter syndrome with this conversation um, because my <laughs> the, the contemporary artists I engage with are mostly from Africa, some in the diaspora. Um, but I completely agree with you. I don't think it does artists a service to show, to organize exhibitions when, you know, their work is not ready. Um, and I feel that, you know, the studio visits that I do, which are, you know, I'm not nearly as many as Arthur does, I'm sure. Um, you know, I you really can tell when some artists have, they have something to say, but it's not quite baked yet. Um, that they're still working through something. And I find that personally, I like talking to artists. I like hearing their ideas. I like hearing where they're going with it, but they don't always have to be at a place where they are, re you know, you know, they may be working. They might need a few more years or another decade till they're ready to show their work. And I think that's, I don't think museums and curators are doing young artists a service by showing their work too soon, um, in my opinion. Yeah, it, thank you for that. It it makes me it makes me wonder how that changes the purpose of a museum. And again, we probably don't have time to go down that rabbit hole. But one of the concerns I have about it is, to me, the museum always represented the pinnacle of sort of like where your career goes. So you you know you can have decades of doing all sorts of different things. And then eventually there's the mid-career survey and then eventually perhaps the retrospective. It's sort of like, that was obviously a very traditional way of looking at how museums, inter how an artist's career intersects with museums. And now it seems as though um, young artists in their twenties will have five or six museum shows under their belt before they're 30. And so it makes me wonder sort of like, so then, so then what are you, what's the, what's the future then, right? Or where, where are you going as far as museums go? I can see where you could go in terms of prices of your work, collections you're in, but then what, what purpose do museums serve in your career if you've already sort of had 15 museum shows before you're 35? Just my yeah. <laughs> thinking. It's, thinking. It's, a good, it's a good question. And um, I mean, I also think that, I mean, we, I've been seeing also, you know, artists who are, are older getting this attention that they, you know, that they should have had at an earlier age. I mean, I think, I think the most exciting thing I saw this year was Zineb Sidira's pavilion at Venice. Um, and she's an artist that, you know, deserves that. I mean, she's worked really hard in her career. And I think that that French pavilion was just, you know, one of the most, I, I will be thinking about that for a very long time. Um, so I feel like, you know, we are beginning to see artists who are kind of overdue for attention as on the flip side of what you're asking, Dexter. Um, but I completely agree. It's, I mean, it's, I don't think it's the museum's place and I, I don't think it, it helps artists in the end, which it really does a disservice. Thank you for sharing that. And Julia, what, what are your thoughts? I... Yeah, I mean, I think it, I agree. I don't think it helps make the work better. I think it's, and and I also think that the press has its own part to play and, and kind of responsibility to take here in that like we follow the buzz also. Um, and that puts the same kind of spotlight that, that a museum show does on an artist before maybe they've had time to mature. Um, and so I do think, a, I, I think that the, those, sorts of things are also where the market and museums get really enmeshed. You know, I think that there, it comes not exclusively, but from, you know, patrons who are saying, hey, I've bought this artist, like, come look, ask a curator to come look. Um, and there may be a great artist, but it's just, it is a sort of different moment in, in the career trajectory than we've seen at Be Traditional, as you said, Dexter. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's going to last forever. Like, I think, I think that the bottom is going to fall out of the market for young artists, not, not entirely, but the kind of like crazy fizzy froth at the top. I think that's going to, going to even out in the next 
year or two is my guess. Um, and so I think you will see some shifts in, in the way that museums are operating as well. Um, but I think it's, it's, you know, in terms of both museum attention and, and market, it really is unprecedented, the level that we're seeing now. Yeah, and I and I I, I sometimes wonder if it's new or amplified. So so you know, in, in some regards, I wonder if what we're seeing, maybe to, to Arthur's earlier point about how technology now we see more of each other, we see more of what we're doing. We see, so I sometimes wonder, is my sense of this rooted in it happening, um, it it sort of being a new th a trend, or is it just that we're able to see more of this activity? I'd imagine, you know, if you go back 25 years ago. Um, someone does a studio visit, they literally have to tell you about it verbally for you to know it happened. The artist has no means of, of sending it out to the world on IG or TikTok that XYZ was just in my studio. So no one would know. So um, now that we seem to know everything that everyone's doing all the time, including what they're eating, it seems like maybe it just feels more amplified we're consuming more media. I, I, you know, again, that's just a speculation. And a lot of these things could be tied to like macroeconomic trends um, that have to do with why people are, um, you know, donating work at the level that they're donating it and people on boards, et cetera. I mean, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother thing uh, that probably we don't have time to get into today. <laughs> um, so uh, one or two more questions before we wrap up today, putting myself in the shoes of uh, an emerging artist. Um, you know, what about, uh, and again, you, you guys may have no opinion on this, but I'm just kind of like curious to hear what you would say. Um, in terms of getting the attention, an artist who wants to get the attention of galleries, is it just about just doing the best work that you can do and, and hoping that you get noticed? Is it about networking with other artists? And again, this may not be in your wheelhouse, Krista or Julia, in terms of the work that you do on a daily basis, but you know, you're in a coffee shop and you meet this young artist. She's 23 years old. She makes fantastic work, but she is at out at sea. She's got no connection. She doesn't know what to do. And she's like, I would love to get in front of a gallery but I have no idea how to do it. You have any opinion on that? Anyone? Uh, look, I mean, I think I think really making those connections is really important. So uh, you know, I go back to the my personal coffee shop example of just you know just being able to connect with someone on a human level and really understanding someone's stories. And I love that you know, as, as for gallerists, you know, going out and doing a studio visit. And it probably shifts if you're like running one of the big guys, you're probably not gonna just run to everyone's studio and see it. But I think, you know, word of mouth or a text from a collector or, hey, I had a visit with this young artist I think you may wanna check out. Those things happen all of the time. And I think that's a really natural way um, to connect. Sometimes great things come from it. Sometimes no more happens than a great relationship is established. Or uh, an artist shared with me that he, there's this gallerist that he, sort of had in mind for his practice, which I thought was amazing. And it, to me, I'm like, that is so not the right program for you. They met with that particular gallerist. It's like, oh, that's not my program. So sometimes you actually can help someone find the right place to focus and shift. And they, I, I can't underestimate enough the human connection and being able to visibly see someone, watch them interact with their work, hear them speak to it, watch how they move through their studio, um, it's something really very special. So I know artists are now flooded with lots of, you know, crazy collectors who are in their you know, DMs going, I'd like to be at peace, how much is it? And when you get to experience the artists up front, you get to understand the why, what they're exploring, what they're trying to say, the stories that they're trying to push forward. And you get to know them a little bit better um, as a human being, and it makes you a little bit more connected to what they're doing. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we have... Um... Uh, a professional practices workshop coming up soon. It's not for the public, it's for students. And I, I, the, the good thing is that I get to decide what the subject matter um, is for these workshops. And so we're doing a writing workshop um, because one of the things that I have found is that a lot of artists do struggle with not only speaking about their work, but certainly writing about their work. And Krista, I'll come to you in terms of like, 
Um, how important do you think it is for uh, an artist to be able to write about their own work? I think an artist should be able to explain their work. I mean, I think, you know, artists are visual people and, you know, writing, some of them are more skilled in writing than others, but I think it certainly helps an artist if they can kind of think about and articulate where they're coming from, why they're doing what they're doing. Um, you know, whether they're an excellent writer, I mean, I'm sure there's a benefit. I, I mean, I'm a big believer in excellent writing. So, but I don't think all artists are excellent writers, um, you know, but I, I do think, you know, for instance, like when I've interviewed Sanford Biggers for, I've written um, a two, two different of his series. He, the words that come out of his mouth, he is such a thoughtful artist about his practice. He he really thinks about it. He he describes this, you know, sources. I mean, he could basically, I feel like I barely do anything as an essayist in, in working with his ideas. And I think it really helps that an artist like, you know, like Sanford and other artists are really very thoughtful about their practice and where they're coming from and their ideas. Um, I think it gives a big leg up. I mean, whether they need to write that in beautiful prose is another thing, um, but I do think it's super important to just be able to to kind of talk about your work and and be reflective about it. You know. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and uh, Julia, what, you you do a lot of writing. What what are, you, what are your thoughts? I mean, I'm sure you've seen some crazy press releases in your day. Oh, uh, artist <laughs> statements, uh, <laughs> exhibition explanations. <laughs> I would give like the two pieces of advice that I have received um, that I think are good pieces of advice for almost any writing, which is first start by imagining that you're talking to your friend at a bar um, and start there. Like the thing that you are drawn to explain first is probably the most interesting part. And it is probably also not the part that if you're sitting in front of a blank page, you would have started with. Um, so I think that, and then also like, if you write a sentence, look at it and take out like half the adjectives, <laughs> um, you know, you really want people to be able to see through the words to get at what you're saying. Um, and I think so often because we are art people, like we go to the, to the too much first. Um, and I think simple is often the best way to communicate. Thank you for sharing that. So, so final question has nothing to do with uh, students and nothing to do with uh, art, art writing or criticism. So the world has seemingly opened up. Uh, uh, Krista's in, in Boston, Julia's in New York, authors in New Orleans, I'm in Japan and Hayama Japan. Um, so travel is, is, is back on the table now. Where, where would you say is your favorite place to go see art? If you can go anywhere right now, limitless budget to go see art, what city would you go to? This is your last question. I'll give you a moment to think. <laughs> <laughs> Where would you go, Krista? Well, I mean, I would like to go back to Ghana um, because I think I haven't been there since 2013. And I think in that time, a lot of really interesting things have been happening in not only in Accra, but in other places. Um, I think the work that Ibrahim Mahama is doing there in Tamale is interesting. Um, I'm really curious about uh, Nana Ofriata Ayim's mobile museums. I think that that's a really important curatorial model. Um, and also, uh, you know, there's this new kind of traveling exhibition, Dig Where You Stand, that Azu Nwagbogo has created. Um, and so I think that to me would be a dream place to go next. Yeah, I, I, Ghana's, Ghana's high on the list. Fantastic. That's Julia, yeah. Julia, That's how about so you? funny. Were you going to say that, Arthur? Yes, I am like dying to actually okay. be there. We need to I do am, it together. I, I'm so blown away by some of the, what I'm seeing from some of the kids that are creating there and uh, I'm, I'm just really blown away. There's a gallery, um, um, ADA Contemporary, Rada Contemporary, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, but she is, every every single email, I want to get on a plane. I want to see what she's seeing. So I'm with you. Donna, here we come. Okay. <laughs> how about you, Julia? Pamela, I kind of want to go with Arthur and Krista to Ghana. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, if I had to pick somewhere else, I would say um, Rio in Brazil is definitely high on my list for next year. The biennial is is happening next year. Um, there are also some really incredible museum shows that have been in the works for years, um, especially looking at, at the indigenous art history there. Um, so that's definitely up there, but maybe I'll do that and then I'll meet you guys. In a okay. Exactly. So like that. We'll, we'll all meet in Ghana, drinks on me. So listen, um, I really appreciate the three of you um, giving your time today. You've been very generous, very patient um, and, and very open and I appreciate it greatly. So on behalf of New York Academy of Art, I wanna thank you. Um, wishing you all a great evening in the uh, different parts of the world or different parts of the US that you're in. And uh, hopefully I'll see you all in person sometime very, very soon. So Krista, author Julia, have a great night and thank you for joining us for conversation. Thank with you. Me. Thank you, Dexter. Nice to you. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.